when Garfinkel says the richest nation in the world has to borrow hundreds of billion dollars to pay its bill, when its middle class citizens sit on a mountain of debt to maintain their living standards, when the nation's economy has difficulty producing secure jobs or enough jobs of any kind, something is amiss. You bet something is amiss. And it goes to the core of why we are here in Memphis. For this conference is about a force, the media, that cuts deep to the foundation of democracy. When Teddy Roosevelt dissected the, what he called the real masters of the reactionary forces in his time, he concluded that indirectly or directly, they control the majority of the great newspapers that are against us. Those newspapers, the dominant media of the day, choked his words. The channels of the information ordinary people needed to understand what was being done to them. And today, well, two basic pillars of American society, shared economic prosperity and a public sector capable of, of serving the common good, are crumbling. The third pillar of American democracy, an independent press, is under sustained attack and the channels of information are choked. A few huge corporations now dominate the media landscape in America. Almost all the networks carried by most cable systems are owned by one of the major media conglomerates. Two thirds of today's newspapers are monopolies. As ownership gets more and more concentrated, fewer and fewer independent sources of information have survived in the marketplace. And those few significant alternatives that do survive, such as PBS and NPR, are under growing financial and political pressure to reduce critical news content and to shift their focus in a mainstream direction, which means being more attentive to establishment views than to the bleak realities of powerlessness that shape the lives of ordinary people. What does today's media system mean for the notion of an informed public cherished by democratic theory? Quite literally, it means that virtually everything the average person sees or hears outside of her own personal communications is determined by the interest of private, unaccountable executives and investors whose primary goal is increasing profits and raising the country's share price. More insidiously, this small group of elites determine what ordinary people do not see or hear. In-depth coverage of anything, let alone the problems real people face day to day, is as scarce as sex, violence, and voyeurism are pervasive. Successful business model or not, by democratic standards, this is censorship of knowledge by monopolization of the means of information values in its current form, which Barry Diller happily describes as oligopoly, media growth has one clear consequence. There is more information and easier access to it, but it's more narrow and homogenous in content and perspective, so that what we see from the couch is overwhelmingly a view from the top. The pioneering communication scholar Murray Edelman wrote that opinions about public policy do not spring immaculately, are automatically into people's minds. They're always placed there by the interpretations of those who most consistently get their claims and manufactured cues publicized widely. For years, the media marketplace for opinions about public policy has been dominated by a highly disciplined, thoroughly networked ideological noise machine, to use David Brock's term, permeated with slogans concocted by big corporations their lobbyists and their think tank subsidiaries, public discourse has effectively changed the meaning of American values. Day after day, the ideals of fairness and liberty and mutual responsibility have been stripped of their essential dignity and meaning in people's lives. 
Day after day, the egalitarian creed of our Declaration of Independence is trampled underfoot by hired experts and sloganeers who speak of the death tax, the ownership society, the culture of life, the liberal assault on God and family, compassionate conservatism, weak on terrorism, the end of history, the clash of civilizations, no child left behind. <laughs> They have even managed to turn the escalation of a failed war into a surge. As if, as if it were a current of electricity through a wire instead of blood spurting from the ruptured vein. The Orwellian filigree of a public sphere in which language conceals reality and the pursuit of personal gain and partisan power is wrapped in rhetoric that turns truth to lies and lies to truth. So it is that limited government has little to do with the Constitution or local autonomy anymore. Now it means corporate domination and the shifting of risk from government and business to struggling families and workers. Family values now mean imposing a sectarian definition on the family of the family on everyone else. Religious freedom now means majoritarianism and public benefits for organized religion without any public burdens. And patriotism has come to mean blind support 